Hello everybody, this is Mr. McNair, and this is a short video on the 2007 OGT questions, specifically from the data analysis and probabilities section. Now what I would suggest you do is take a moment, go ahead and pause the video, and read through these tips so that you can kind of familiar yourself with how they work. Alright, let's go into question number one. Ruben, has, uh, Ruben used an altimeter to measure and record his height above sea level at different times during his hike in the mountains. Which type of data display could Ruben use to show how his height above sea level changed with time? Now, one of the key phrases here is changed with time. Okay, anytime you see something that says change with time, generally the best data, to rep or best way to represent that is through line graphs. Line graphs always show change in data over time. So, our answer for that one is A. Number five, the noon temperatures are recorded for seven consecutive days in Cleveland, Ohio. The sum of the seven temperatures is positive. Which statement about these seven temperatures must be true? Now, when you have a problem like this, what I would suggest that you do is go through each of the choices and start eliminating the ones that don't make sense. All right, even after you come to one that you think could be the answer, I will still go through the rest of them and just make sure that those don't make sense either. Okay, so let's look at part A. The mean of the temperatures is positive. Well, how do you find the mean of something? Well, another word for mean is average, and you find the average or the mean by taking the total number, the sum of the entries, and you divide it by the number of entries that you have. So in this problem, we don't know specifically what the sum is. The only thing we know about the sum is that it's positive. It's a positive number. And the number of entries we have is 7. Now, anytime you take a positive number and divide it by another positive number, the answer is always going to come out to be positive. So the mean of the temperatures is positive. Does that make sense? Is that always going to be true? Well, in this scenario, yes, it will. All right, so A is our answer, but let's go through the other choices just to make sure that those um, don't make sense. So part B, it says the mode of the temperature is positive. Mode is talking about most uh, the entry that occurs most frequently. Now, I'm going to go ahead and make up a set of data, such as negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, negative 1, 15, 30, and 45. Here's seven temperatures. They fit our data because if we added them all up, the answer, the sum of these temperatures would be positive. But the mode here, the mode would be what? The mode would be negative one because that occurs four times. All right. So is it possible that we could have a set of data that the sum is positive, but the mode is negative? Yes, we came out with that one here. So we know that B couldn't be the answer. C. The median of the temperatures is positive. Well, median median is talking about when you put the, the data entries in order from smallest to largest, median is the one that occurs in the middle. Well, here, using the same set of data, what's the median? Well, here the median is negative 1. That's the number in the middle. So still, this set of data is true, and the median came out to be negative. So that one couldn't be it. D, excuse me, D. The minimum of the temperatures is positive. Once again, using the same set of data, what's the minimum going to be? Well, the minimum is still going to be negative 1 here, but our sum is positive. So again, D couldn't be the answer, so A makes sense here. All right. Because mean, median, and mode are so important, I want to make sure that you know how to calculate these. So for example, let's say um, you have to find the mean of the data set 45, 75, 83, and 93. So what you're going to do is take all of those entries and you're going to add them up. So 45 plus 75 plus 83 plus 93. And then you're going to divide by the number of entries that you have. And the number of entries we have is 4. So when you add 45 plus 75 plus 83 plus 93, you get 296. All right, and we'll bring over that 4. And 296 divided by 4 is 74. So that would be the mean or the average of that set of data. 
Next, mode. Mode is the number that occurs the most frequently or the most often. Here we have this set of data and the number that occurs the most often is 68 because it occurs twice. So 68 would be the mode. Every other number only occurs once. All right, and median. Median is the number in the middle when you place all the numbers in order from smallest to largest. So here, um, the number in the middle of these seven numbers, the number in the middle would be 75. All right, because you have three higher than it and three lower than it. Um, I get a lot of questions about, well, what happens if you have an even number? Well, the number in the middle in this one, because there's only six entries, you actually have two numbers in the middle, 11 and 12. The median here would be the number that's directly between 11 and 12. And the number directly in between or in the middle of 11 and 12 is 11 and a half. You kind of take the mean of those two numbers, add them together, divide by two. All right. Let's go on to the next problem. Number 17. Casey has one afternoon to run errands involving buying a sweater, mailing a package, and buying groceries. There are three clothing stores, two post offices, and four grocery stores within a 10-mile radius. How many combinations of one clothing store, one post office, and one grocery store are available within a 10-mile radius? So here, what I suggest you do, um, you actually have two options. You could go ahead and make a tree diagram and say, okay, well, here's all the options for sweaters. And then from those options, here's all the options to mail a package. And from those, all of those options, here's all the options to buy groceries. But the quicker way to do this problem is called the counting principle. And the counting principle says that when you have all of these options, you could just multiply all of your options together. So for example, um, you're trying to buy a sweater, mail a package, and buy groceries. How many options do you have to uh, buy a sweater? Well, there are three clothing stores. So you can buy, there's three options there. How many options do you have to mail the package? Well, there's two post offices. So we can put that there. And how many places can you go and um, buy groceries? Well, there's four grocery stores. In the counting principle, you multiply all of your choices together. All right, so three times two is six, six times four is 24. So there are 24 combinations um, that you could possibly do within a 10 mile radius. Great. Next, number 20. Luca randomly chose a marble from a bag, recorded the color, and replaced the marble before choosing again. The table shows the number of times each color of marbles was chosen. So according to the data in the table, what is the experimental probability of picking a green marble? Okay. So whenever you're trying to find probability, the formula that you're generally using is this. Probability is the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. So here, um, the number of favorable outcomes is the number of times, the number of outcomes that we got when we picked a green marble. So the favorable outcomes is here, 17. And we're dividing that by the total number of outcomes. Well. This is the total, the whole thing is the total, including the red, the green, the blue, and the yellow, that's the total. When you add up 42 plus 17 plus 27 plus 14, the total, the sum, is 100. So the probability of, the experimental probability of picking a green would be 17 over 100. All right, simple as that. All right, number 22, the Ohio Big Green, or the, the Ohio Big Tree Program lists the largest living specimen of each kind of tree found in the state. Three measurements are needed to assign a score to each tree. Their circumference, uh, one inch gives you one point. The height, one foot, gives you one point. And the average crown spread, one foot, gives you one fourth of a point. The score is found by adding the numbers of points for each measurement. Four trees and their measurements are given below. Okay, so because this is a big problem, we go to the next slide. Um, so here's our table. It says, in your answer document, calculate the score for each of the four trees in the table, arrange the trees in order based on their scores, and show work or provide an explanation to support your answer. Write a formula for computing the score assigned by the Ohio Big Tree Program. So once again, they tell us that the circumference 
one inch gives us one point, then the height, one foot gives us one point, and then the average crown spread, one foot gives us one fourth of a point. So let's look at the American basswood. So the American basswood, we get one point for each inch of the circumference. So that would be 175 points. The height, we get one foot, one point for each foot. So that would be 69 points. And the average crown spread, we get one fourth of a point for each foot. So to calculate that, we're just going to take one fourth times the number of feet. Okay. And here we have 68. So one fourth of 68. Also, just could, you could just divide that by four. Um, is 17. So the score that you would get would be given by adding all of those up. So 175 plus 69 plus 17 gives us a total score of 261 for the American basswood. All right, let's go ahead and do that with the American beach. All right, so once again, we get 222 points for the circumference. We get 130 points for the height. And then we're going to take 1 fourth of 75, or 75 divided by 4, which is 18 0.75. We'll add those all together, and we get a total of 370.75. All right, next we have the black oak. Here we're going to get 249.6 points for the circumference, 55 points for the height, and 1 fourth of 94 is 23.5. When we add those all up, we get a total of 328.1. And then lastly, we have the Eastern Hemlock. So we get 140 points for this one, for the circumference. Um, for the height, we get 138 points. And for the average crown spread, we get one fourth of the 52.2, which is 13.05. Add those all together. And we get 291.05. So um, once again, it says calculate the scores for each of the four trees. And we did that. And then it says arrange the trees in order based on their scores. So the smallest tree based on score would be the American basswood. Then next, we have the eastern hemlock. Then next, we would have the black oak. And then next, we would have the American beach. Now, I would suggest that you write those out in order, OK? Write out American basswood, eastern hemlock, black oak, then American beach, OK? And then after you do that, um, we already showed our work up here in the table. All of our work is in here already. That's our work, so we're good. Um, write a formula for computing the score assigned by the Ohio Beach Big Tree Program. So we did that by um, our formula would, for our score would be our score was calculated by taking the circumference. And then adding in the height of the tree. And then adding in one fourth of the average crown spread. Okay. So there is our formula. All right, great. Moving on, number twenty three. Each week, Ms. Hiroma has each of the 25 students in her class write his or her own name on a piece of paper. All the pieces of paper are put in a jar, and one student's name is drawn from the jar. If Jamie's name was drawn last week, what is the probability that it will be drawn again this week? So once again, we talked about probability before. Probability is the number of favorable outcomes divided by the total number of outcomes. Um, and here. How many times is Jamie's name in the jar? Well, Jamie's name is in the jar one time. Even if he, his name was drawn last week, because every week she has her students write their names and put them in a the jar, um, Jamie's name is always going to be in the jar one time. 
Right. And how many total students does Mrs. Haroma have? Well, she has 25 students. So the probability of Jamie's name being drawn is 1 25th. Okay. 26. An inspector of a nail factory checks a sample of nails to measure their deviation from the standard length. Positive deviations mean a nail is too long. Negative deviations mean it's too short. So the problem says, based on the inspector's chart above, what is the true what is true of the nails produced at this factory? So I would go through these, just take a look and um, start eliminating the choices that don't make sense. So part A, the nails produced all have standard length. Well, that's not true because we said that a positive deviation, like we have here, a positive deviation means that the nails are too long, and a negative deviation, like we have here below zero, means that the nails are too short. So positive deviation, these are too long. Negative deviation, these are too short. The only ones that are standard length are the ones that are exactly at zero, and that's that little bar in there, that one. Okay, so part A, the nails produce all half standard length? Uh, no, definitely not. Okay, because we have some that are too long and some that are too short. B, the nails are much more likely to be too long than too short. Well, once again, here's all the nails that are too long. And then we have this big section where that are too short. Okay, so is, it, is that a true statement? No. C, the nails are much more likely to be sh too short than too long. Well, that seems to be the case because too short is a huge section where comparatively too long is smaller. So this seems like it would be the answer. Let's look at D though, just to make sure. The nails are about as likely to be, be too long as they are to be too short. Well, once again, the too short section seems to be a lot bigger than the too long section. So our answer is C. All right, next, number 31. To test the effect of a new medication on reaction time, two groups of five adults were asked to step on a pedal as soon as they saw a flashing light on a video screen. One group received the medication and the other group did not receive the medication. The reaction times in fractions of a second are shown for each of the two groups. So um, how much longer is the, median, the mean reaction time of the group receiving the medication than the group not receiving the medication. Okay, so here's our set of data. All right, the group receiving the medication had these times, and once again, to find the mean, you're averaging the numbers. You add them all up, and you divide by how many you have. So we're going to add these numbers up and divide by how many we have. When we add the 0.55 plus 0.65 plus 0.60 plus 0.50 plus 0.70, we get a total of 3. And there's a total of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 numbers. And 3 divided by 5 is the decimal 0.6 or 0 0.60. All right, now let's go ahead and go to the group not receiving the medication. When you add up their times of 0 0.20, 0 0.30, 0 0.25, 0 0.20, and 0 0.03, that adds up to a total of 1.25. And once again, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 entries. And 1.25 divided by 5 is 0.25. Now the question says, how much longer is the mean reaction time of the group receiving the medication? So since we're trying to find how much longer, we're trying to find how much is the difference between those. Okay, so we're going to be subtracting 0 0.60, excuse me, not negative 0 0.60, but 0 0.60 minus 0.25. All right, and when you subtract those, you get 0.35. Okay, so the, the group receiving the medication is 0.35 seconds longer. All right, so that was sec uh, choice A. All right, number 34. The local newspaper publishes a list of the five most popular radio stations. Lisa's favorite station is not on the list. At school, she asks two of her friends what their favorite station is. 
and they both choose Lisa's favorite station. Based on this, Lisa decides her favorite station should have been on the list. In your answer document, explain why Lisa's conclusion is not valid by giving two reasons why her sample is biased. Now, we're just going to talk about this real quick. I'm not going to write the answer down. But when you talk about biased, bias has to deal with um, a, a group of people not being random. Okay, so here, Lisa goes to school and asks her two friends. So it could be bias, number one, because the people that are in Lisa's school are around her same age, right? So since they're around the same age, that's not a very good sample because... Um, what about the people that are not in school? You know, what if they're in their 50s and 60s? There's a lot of people not in school. So um, it's biased because she only asks that certain age range. And then secondly, you could also say it's biased because she asks her friends, right? Most likely, friends are going to have the same interests that, um, as their other friends. So because of that, that's also another reason why it's biased. All right, number 39. Rob has three red, four white, two blue, and five green t-shirts in his drawer. He picks a red shirt on Monday without looking, and he notices a stain on it and puts it in the wash. Without looking, Rob then picks another shirt from his drawer. What is the probability he will pick a red shirt on his second try? So, let's look at our data. So, he has three red shirts, four white shirts, two blue shirts, and five green shirts. But he takes one of the red shirts and puts it in the washing machine because he sees a stain. So we not now we don't have on his second try, we don't have three red shirts to choose from. We only have two. So once again, we know that probability is the number of favorable outcomes over the total number of outcomes. So here, the, pro, the favorable outcome would be picking a red shirt. So, how many red shirts does he have now that one is in the wash? Well, he has two. How many total number of shirts does he have now that one is in the wash? Well, two plus four plus two plus five, that's a total of 13. So, the probability of him picking a red shirt on the second try is two out of 13. All right, number 43. This, the, the histogram below displays student scores on Mr. Dell's English exam. How many students scored below 70 on the exam? Well, the students that scored below 70 on their exam are represented by these bars here. The score is 50 to 59, and the score is 60 to 69. Everybody else scored either 70 or higher. So in the 50 to 59 category, we had two students. In the 60 to 69 category, we had four students. So that's a total of six students. All right. Great. That was the uh, 2007 data analysis and probability. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Good luck studying.